We're going to make maple syrup, saw logs, and visit Yellowwood State Forest today on Indiana Outdoors. Hello and welcome to Indiana Outdoors. I'm Jill Dittmeyer. And I'm Don Van Meter. We're in beautiful Brown County today at Yellowwood State Forest near Nashville. Lots of people are familiar with Brown County State Park, but fewer have visited Yellowwood. Mm -hmm. Coming up, we're going to speak with the property manager here at the forest, but first, we're going to visit a wildlife refuge. Yes, people visit Muscatatuck National Wildlife Refuge for a variety of reasons. Wildlife photography, hunting, fishing, hiking. Mm -hmm. Muscatatuck is located on I-65 near Seymour. It's about a two-hour drive from Indianapolis, Cincinnati, and Louisville. Yeah, people from the city can use Muscatatuck as a refuge too. Let's see what they have there. Okay. The Scatatuck National Wildlife Refuge was established in 1966 as a great place to have wood duck broods. Wood ducks at that time had very limited brood habitat, which is where they have their young and raise their young. And the goal from the bird duck stamp days was to be able to purchase land in order to have good waterfowl production areas. And Muscatatuck here at Seymour, Indiana, this area was identified in 1966 we became a refuge. The land was purchased and we now have over 7,000 acres of land that's almost five miles long by three miles wide of some of the best wood duck habitat, which is wooded wetlands. Well, Muscatuck's a unique place. We probably have a little bit of everything. We have sightings of over 250 bird species throughout our history. We have an awful lot of mammals. In fact, we're home to the first introduction area of the river otter into the state of Indiana. Probably our rarest critter would be the copper belly water snake. And it is throughout portions of its reign as a federally threatened species. Here at Muscatatuck, it is considered a state endangered species. And we have a, a probably one of the best populations and one of the longest term studies on that particular water snake anywhere. We do have quite a bit of public use opportunities here at Muscatatuck. We do have a visitor center. We have nine miles of driving roads for public use. We have eight hiking trails, anywhere from a half mile to a six mile trail. We allow biking on the roads. We do have fishing. We do have hunting. We do offer conservation field days. We also have interpretive trails hiking trails that the teachers can come use. We have a, an excellent video at our bookstore and our visitor center. And the property is here. It's open to the public 365 days a year, sunrise to sunset. And as long as we follow the rules and have fun, that's what we're after because we are here primarily for the wildlife first. At the Visitor Center, we were fortunate that we, uh, our Muscatuck Wildlife Society, their bookstore raised enough funds that they decided they would like to have some uh, bird watching opportunity. Now the bird viewing room was first ideal. It started as a big picture window that they purchased and then, then we went and decided that wasn't big enough so we busted the wall out and with the volunteers and the Wildlife Society money and the partners with the Fish and Wildlife Service at Muscatatuck, we built onto it and then we created with their assistance a backyard viewing habitat area so that they, they can get an idea and that everyone in the public can get an idea of how even with a limited space at your own home in your own backyard or, or front yard, side yard, whichever you have the best bird viewing area from, from your house, that you could do these things to create a nice habitat and enjoy 
drinking your coffee in the morning and watching the birds and the squirrels and the chipmunks or the little frogs or whatever salamander, five-line skink might show up. The mission of the Fish and Wildlife Service is to restore, protect, and enhance land and its habitat for the American people. Uh, at Muscatatech National Wildlife Refuge, as far as supporting the refuge, of course, we are a federal property. We are supported by your taxpayer dollars. We are a part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife System and a part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The best support you can do is to be conservation-minded and to, to realize that we live all together and hopefully can take care of our resources and have wise stewardship of the land and think of wildlife first. That, so that's, you know, real important and the best way to support is to, to realize that. Jill and I are in Yellowwood State Forest today. It's a wonderful day. We see lots of people out there. And we have uh, Jim Allen with us, the property manager. Jim, you see so many people around here. What all can you do here in the woods? Well, uh, here at Yellowwood, we have quite a few activities. We have a, a lake that is really kind of a focus of the attention here. And a lot of people come out here to uh, fish in the lake. And uh, we also have rowboat rentals on the lake. So people can come out for maybe just a couple hours and rent a boat and go out and row around and in the lake and then come back in. Also we have campgrounds which is primitive camping around the lake and um, you can stay there overnight or for you know several days if you want mm -hmm. and go fishing. We also have hiking trails out here. We have um, several miles, probably about 14 miles of hiking trails that you can come out and enjoy. We also have a horse campground so if you have a horse you can bring your horse in. Mm -hmm. We have marked horse trails for you to use. And during the fall and in the spring, we have hunting season going on. So this spring we'll have turkey hunting not too long. And then in the fall, we have squirrel and, and deer hunting going on. And those are probably the biggest pursuits that people come out for. And a lot of people come out just to observe nature also. Uh, we have a lot of bird watchers that come out and people who just like to come out in the woods and enjoy some quiet time and relax and take it all in. So. Do we have a lot of forest in Indiana like this? We have about 150,000 acres wow. of state forest okay. in the state, and we have here at Yellowwood about 23,500 acres. And it's, it is a rather secluded uh, part, so it's quite a little drive to get back in here. But once you're back here, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of different trees back here. Talk a little bit about the different hardwoods that we might see. Yeah, in Indiana, we have some of the, actually have some of the finest hardwoods mm -hmm. in the country. We have a lot of the oaks, the white oak and red oak groups. In the white oak, we have the white oak, chinkapin oak, and chestnut oak, uh, red oaks. We have red oak, black oak, wow. we have scarlet oak, <laughs> and then Kids we have a lot of the maples. leaf collections probably mm -hmm. are out here all the time. Huh? We actually get quite a few <laughs> students who come yes. out and try to do leaf collections, and of course they bring the leaves into us and say, well, what kind of leaf is <laughs> yes. this? So, but we're glad to help them out. And we also have a tree identification trail oh, yeah. over at Morgan Monroe State Forest, which I also manage. Sure. And you can go there and the trees are identified for you, so you can get a leaf from that tree and already know what it is. Why is it important to take care of those trees and to be able to still offer that many trees for people to come and visit and, and see? Well, um, around the turn of the century, most of this area that we're standing on right now was cleared of the forest. Um, the logging industry kind of came through in a sweep in the area and also a lot of people tried to make a living off farming the land so they cleared the trees and built houses and then uh, soon the soil was pretty depleted and started eroding heavily so at that time it was during the depression a lot of people just couldn't make it on this property so the state came in or the federal government on in the case here mm -hmm. and purchased the land from these people and then they came in and started planting a lot of these trees that you see here, which are pine trees, which are not native to Indiana. So if you see these pine trees, at least in this area of the mm -hmm. country, they aren't. Uh, they were planted, and that was to help control the erosion that was going on, and also to help bring the soil back up to a level where it can support the hardwood species that we have in Indiana. Now, one thing about a state forest is that we actually harvest trees in the state forest, and that's different than some mm -hmm. of our other properties. Tell us a little bit about your harvesting. Yes, we are the Division of Forestry, which is unique in Department of Natural Resources. We are the only division that uh, has the charge to actually manage the trees for lumber and other uses. Okay. So we do come into the forest and on a regular basis we harvest a small percentage of the trees out there. We have 
foresters who are trained professionally and they go out and mark individual species yes. and take out individual trees that we feel will go out and maybe look at an area and as trees die they fall out of the forest and what we want to do is try to uh, recover those before they die so that material can be utilized and it can provide a renewable resource for some of the local industry. And so we'll go in and, and mark those trees and some other trees to help other trees grow. And then we'll put it up for sale and we'll sell it to a licensed timber buyer. Well, it's a great day. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. And we're it's glad to be here it. in Yellowwood. Yeah. And well, we're, we're looking, glad to have you. We're looking forward to the rest of the day. Okay, great. Thanks, Thanks Jim. Jim. Nice meeting you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yellowwood State Forest is tucked away in the beautiful hills of Brown County. There's no gate fee and the 80 campsites are filled on a first come first served basis. Call 812-988-7945 for more information. Well, we heard Jim talk about lumbering and recently we visited a sawmill in Terre Haute. You know, a century ago, sawmills were run with steam engines, teams of horses, and lots of hard labor. <laughs> now today, the most important machine at a sawmill is yeah. a computer. Meet Percy Mossbarger of Kirkham Hardwoods, a modern-day lumberman. It's purely uh, supply and demand. The wood industry in general is, is very large for the state of Indiana. It's uh, currently, I think it's about the fifth largest employer and the seventh largest payroll. So I mean, it, it has a, quite an economic uh, effect. The main timber probably is from central to the southern area. Uh, but, I mean, it, it, it's all over the state of Indiana. To produce lumber, of course, I mean, first you have to find the landowner that's willing to uh, sell trees. And we have a forester that will go out and mark the trees, uh, discuss with the landowner how we feel that the wood should uh, be managed. And we'll remove these trees and, and bring them to the mill. It goes through a debarker, uh, which is a machine that removes the bark. Uh, it actually serves three purposes. Number one, it removes the bark, which is a product that we can sell. Uh, you mulch around trees with it. It also cleans the log. And uh, actually, by removing this bark off the outside, the little thin slab that we take off the first pass, which is not usable for lumber, then is chipped. It goes through a chipper, and uh, actually, we sell it to the paper mill, which they make corrugation. Uh, international papers where we sell our chips and they make corrugation for uh, the layers between the cardboard box. And the sawdust actually is used too. We sell it to, uh, to for horse bedding. Uh, we sell it also to generate power. Our timber stand base is really it's an agricultural crop. Uh, it's not like corn or soybeans where we do it annually. It is something though that we need to manage and we need to cut. Red oak is not what we call a shade tolerant tree. In other words, little red oak trees will not grow underneath a big canopy. Timber that grows on good soil, selectively marked, properly harvested, uh, there's no reason a person cannot have a harvest every, say, 12 to 15 years. It's a good hard day's work. When you go home, you've done something. You feel satisfied. 
Not much remains of pioneer life when Indiana was unsettled. For example, bison, sometimes called buffalo, used to roam the Hoosier State. Mm -hmm. Well, now you can get an up-close look at American bison at a park in Bluffton in Wells County. Yeah, Indiana Outdoors visited Wabash State Park, sometimes called Obachi by the locals, to see their bison herd. Mm -hmm. These are um, American bison. Their scientific name is bison bison. We are the last state property um, in the Department of Natural Resources to keep and maintain uh, these animals. We have a 20-acre compound, uh, which most people feel as though it's not really a, a zoo atmosphere in which they're confined to small space. Uh, we don't provide any shelter out here other than, than the small wood lot. Uh, that we have with, within the pen. There is a small pond in there for them for water. Uh, we feed uh, during the winter months uh, hay and then uh, an oats and molasses supplement. But in the summertime, they primarily pasture. There is a trail completely around the, the 20 acres here. They could be anywhere within this 20 acre uh, pen. And, but, but people can access the, the entire circumference of it and generally find them pretty easily. We have a prolific herd. Um, we had the four young last year. We've only had one so far this summer. We may have more. Bison typically are not aggressive animals unless they're provoked. They have been known to, to charge the fence if, if um, they are provoked or if there are young in the pen and, and the mother is uh, protective. So typically there, there's not a problem with these animals and maintaining them. It's only when they have to be handled uh, either for loading uh, purposes or veterinary care. Uh, and, and that becomes a time at which uh, they, they can be extremely dangerous. One of the reasons that we decided when we reviewed our master plan for this property to not eliminate the bison was their popularity as far as what to do when, when you come to this park. It, it, it seems that a lot of people come out here and make this part of their day. They are unique and a popular attraction that we have here. You know, a familiar sight in Indiana is the turkey vulture. But would you want to spend your life <laughs> looking at those ugly birds? Well, well, I wouldn't. But in our next story, we go to Randolph County to visit a wildlife biologist who spends his days trapping and tracking turkey vultures. Hmm. I've always had an interest in turkey vultures. You know, their life habits are pretty interesting. Here you have a bird that relies solely on dead material to feed. And then just to watch their, their capabilities in flight, see how they just float? Just hang on the air. I'm a graduate student in biology at Ball State University. I work with turkey vultures as my graduate research project. I must say I enjoy being a biologist. It's, it's a lot of long hours. Sometimes it feels like it's thankless work, but it's for more than just a dollar. Wildlife research quite often seems to be very glamorous. 15 minutes with the turkey vulture is all I actually get to handle and see the vulture up close. After that, I'm in the van tracking. I have a, an old Chevrolet van um, that was converted over into a telemetry vehicle. I put transmitters on turkey vultures and I need a, a means by which I can follow them every minute of the day that they're in flight, which means I have to be mobile, but at the same time be able to have a directional finding capability. So we've taken my van and custom fabricated a 15-foot telescopic rotational mast, which in short allows me to drive around um, the back roads, country roads of Indiana and pursue the turkey vultures with the direction finding capabilities of the antenna. I can track the vultures pretty much anywhere with the, with the mobile unit, but then eventually the road's gonna stop and I'm gonna have to walk on foot 
to locate the vulture. I use the handheld H antenna to walk in on the vulture and, and physically see it. You know, I have a level of devotion that I just have to do this type of work. As a kid growing up, I was allowed to go outside and, and enjoy the outdoors and hike and camp and fish and just generally spend a lot of time outside with my family. And it eventually it dawned on me one day that it really meant a lot to me to be surrounded by creatures and to have you know places that are, are basically an adventure to go to, somewhere we can go and potentially see a turkey vulture. Turkey vultures are designed to utilize um, updrafts and thermal currents, which are a currents that rise up in the atmosphere. Initially, they may use pirate flight to get off the ground, but it's not long that they'll catch a thermal and they ride up high into the atmosphere. The thermal rise is usually in a circle pattern, almost like a, a tornado. People see them as being ugly or gruesome. I try not to, you know, initially get upset with somebody that has maybe the wrong impression of turkey vultures. And with any luck, um, you know, my research in a public aspect can get across good ideas to people and make them understand that turkey vultures are not a nuisance. They're simply uh, a natural scavenger. They do us a great service by um, consuming dead and decaying material. Uh, any good research project just leads to more questions, and that's basically what's happened here. You know, as time goes on, I'm just finding more things that I have questions about. I, and these birds hold a special place for me. I mean, I spend the majority of my days uh, working with these birds. Watch the bird fly and truly gain an appreciation for how magnificent these animals are. And um, if you have a roost on your property or you see them flying, you're lucky. It's, 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 an, it's, a, it's a great thing to have those birds flying around. Take appreciation in them and tell other people about them. Explain them to your kids. Well, I like birds. So even though um, we may not initially understand the role of, say, the turkey vulture, um, that's not the point. The point is it's here, it survives. Now we have to make sure that we, we uh, see it surviving in the future. Earlier, Jim talked about all the beautiful hardwood here at Yellowwood Forest, but did you know that maple syrup comes from Indiana hardwood? Uh, one day in early spring, our reporter Ryan Tucker made maple syrup with some school children at Asher Wood Environmental Science Center near Marion. This is a sweet story. Dave. Oh, Jill. <laughs> The old-fashioned art of maple syrup production is still alive in Indiana today. And at the Asherwood Environmental Science Center, children can experience this Hoosier tradition firsthand. Indiana, Wisconsin, Michigan, New York, Vermont. Jerry Sweeten has been making maple syrup at Asherwood for 20 years. These Marion students are spending a day with him, learning about the sugaring process. Good. You want to try? You can try next. Take a couple cranks. You want to put it in too far or you'll damage the tree. You just, that's about as fast as you'll ever see a tree drift. You want to put the bucket on? See if you can hear it hit the bottom of the bucket. At that rate, that bucket will be full tomorrow. When you get your bucket with sap, you take your hands, rub them together a little bit, then you scoop them in the sap. You can do that. And you get a big drink. And you need to get enough that it dribbles down your chin a little bit. None of this just sticking your finger in there. You gotta scoop your hands and get a big old drink. Let me just go. Let me just go. Don't spill it. Some children enjoy the taste of raw sap. <laughs> Others would prefer to wait for the final product. Yuck. It's amazing it takes 50 gallons of this sap to make one gallon of maple syrup.
After the trees have been tapped, the sap is brought to the sugar house. This rustic house, originally built in the 1920s, is where it all boils down. We have some sap here that's cooked for a long, long time, and now it's, it's finished, or very close to being finished. Remember how clear the sap was? Now look at the color of this. See the difference in the color? The maple syrup must be around 220 degrees before it's ready to be drained off and filtered. How long that going to that? Most of the maple syrup that's sold in grocery stores is actually made from corn syrup uh, with artificial maple flavoring. Uh, you can buy 100% pure maple syrup in the grocery store. It usually comes in small 8-ounce bottles. The TV crew really loved our last assignment, eating maple syrup on waffles. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, those waffles and maple syrup makes me think it's time to close the show. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us this time on Indiana Outdoors.